Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to All in London. Today we're going to continue with December's exceptional story, The Green King. I'm kind of in the middle of my Christmas New Year break, but I realised I hadn't finished the exceptional story, so here we are. <laughs> Let's follow the summons to court. You find a most unwelcome sight as you return to your lodgings. Two letters addressed to yourself. The first is written in a familiar green ink and sealed with the wax emblem of Saint Fiacres. It transpires you are found guilty of blasphemy, public and notorious. You are thus compelled to attend a clerical court. Did Henry VIII not abolish those? Seemingly there has been a loophole Found. There can be no doubt, this is the work of the old pretenders. With every day that passes, your scandal grows. Already there is a campaign in the Gazette denouncing you. They have been busy while you were away. The second is an invitation to Lady Jane's house at Marshalsea for a soiree the evening before the dinner of the Green King. That I'll have to wait. The law does not. Ah, let's read the list of charges. What are you accused of this time? The usual indictments of blasphemy, public outrage, notorious and willful conduct. You are accused of further acts both improbable, impossible, and no longer illegal since the act of union. Someone has done a very thorough job. A fleet of lawyers would take years to muster an adequate defence, draining your coffers and soiling your reputation with each new rebuttal. But buried amidst the legalese is a conciliatory note. It is a request for parley, a truce and a promise of safe conduct. Witnessed and sealed, it concerns your invitation to dine at the Green King and information you ought to hear concerning your recent acquaintance with Lady Jane. A time and date are attached. A courthouse. Midnight. Tonight. The Court of Resurrection. The court is lit by morning candles. Like the set of a Jacobean murder play, there is a dock and jury's bench. The bench is occupied, the dock empty. There is nowhere to house lawyers nor judge. Evidently, tonight you'll be tried by your peers. Six members sit on the jury bench. One rises as you enter the grisly justice. You have demonstrated courage and intelligence and tenacity in your pursuit of us, but perhaps not wisdom given your choice of companion. Her voice lowers. We have invited you to dine, but that is not why you are here. We have gathered to judge her, not you. You are free to leave as you please, but we are curious. Your verdict on the Lady Jane of Marshalsea. Hmm. So we can either testify for Jane, she has provided information you could not, and helped you learn all that you have, or we can testify against Jane. You do not trust her, not even against the old pretenders. Well, I know for a fact that the old pretenders stab somebody in the back, so I think I'm going to side with Jane. Gasps and frantic whispers from the bench. The scratching of pen on paper. Warrants being drawn up. Defamations of character. The writing continues the murmurs. Hush. Everything you say about Lady Jane seems to surprise and appall the surviving members of the old pretenders. Perhaps an unwise choice, the judge says when you fall silent. But we have all made ours. It is unfortunate you would choose not to sacrifice an ally. The invitation was not for you, and perhaps that is for the best. 
The justice continues as though nothing of import has been said. We have a gift for you. A token of good sportsmanship, shall we say. He gestures with one black gloved hand and another of the masked jury steps forward, holding something behind a silken cloth. Let's receive a gift from the old pretenders. They have pledged to do you no harm, at least until dinner. Behind the silk, a key, small and silver, engraved with the initials JM. It will unlock a door in a manner at which you have an upcoming appointment. Do not ask how we came to have it. We keep a careful eye on all our appointees. The judge turns, ushering her fellow pretenders after her, into the candle-dark shadows once more. You know what we are, and what we have done. Perhaps you will choose to join us all the same, or come and try to put an end to our rituals. You know where to find us, either way. But your ally, she has not told you everything. For one, her father never came to us. How could he? He was long dead before we knew of him. I suggest you open that door. It would be a shame were you to perish before our appointment. And then he's gone. You do not see the door open that takes them away. You remain alone in the empty courtroom, holding only Lady Jane's key. I guess we should go to this soiree. Lady Jane's house is made of red brick, smart and imposing. It sits above Elderwick, set apart from the rest of the neighbourhood, both vantage and architecture demonstrating the occupant's lofty disdain for her neighbours and her need to be counted among them. There is an old date above the lintel, 1811, in God We Trust. Candles burn in the windows. Lady Jane is entertaining tonight. I guess we'll be presented. Footmen in red velvet wait to spirit you inside Marshall C. House. Within Lady Jane's house is curiously spartan. A jumble of mismatched furnishing styles, periods and portraits compete for the eye's attention. Nothing here is contemporary, and very few pieces match. It is the home of someone with a bohemian's ostatious lack of care for tradition, and with the purse of Midas. Guests of sundry walks of life circle the candlelit halls, shocking each other by their presence. Rumours run thick as split wine. Lady Jane is a convict, a libertine, an outcast from polite society. Her parents are variously dead, orphaned or thriving in Drudgewick. Which is all to say, no one seems to know a thing. That is no sign of your hostess, despite her express invitation. You mingle idly, while the moneyed and the carefree circulate canapes and gossip. Everyone seems to think it is a marvellous joke to be so casually snubbed by one's host. Eventually, a footman is at your elbow. He tells you Lady Jane will see you shortly. She is upstairs, alone. You may go up whenever you are ready. The servants know you are expected, and thus to be left alone. So we can search for Lady Jane's private effects. The old pretenders have told you she has betrayed you. Betray in turn. I'm going to mingle. I'm just going to go with it. Let's see where this goes. Hold your faith in Lady Jane. Do not pry where you have not been invited. Lady Jane keeps herself apart. Everyone here seems to know her by reputation rather than sight. She has cultivated acquaintances via letter, and occasionally at less demanding clubs. All walks of life are represented here. The arts, the courts, the clergy, the university. Is this the source of her information on the old pretenders? Is she 
unknowingly, the Pretender's Avenger, and her guest's Saviour? If you escape the Pretender's unscathed, of course. One thread shines amidst the gossip. Where charity is the providence of nobility, Lady Jane disdains it. As a matter of principle, she never gives a hand up. A footman, perhaps even the same one as earlier, finds you. She is ready, he says, before leading you to an empty room in the upper house. There is a fire on the hearth, and a familiar piece of paper on the desk. Let's read what she's left behind. He has intended you to see this. Why arrange matters in such a way otherwise? The parchment is the same crisp white. The text, the same mossy verdigris. It is the original of the invitation you received. This version is different in two particulars, however. In the first, the oath, so inexpertly clipped from yours, is present. The crown makes a king of him, and gifts he will bestow upon his servants, loyal and six. In the second, the name of the invitee is different. It is not you who the old pretenders summoned as their sixth guest. It was Jane of Marshall Sea Prison. A door opens. Concealed behind a lacquered screen, Lady Jane steps into the room. Her eyes on you. She is not smiling, but nor does she appear surprised. She pours wine. Two cups. I wanted to be certain, before I accepted the invitation, if there was risk. I was wrong, if there was no means of opposing them, while also taking what they stole. She smiles. I am a thief, you see. Or my parents were. Debtors, both. They died in the fall, and the prison was opened onto the neath roof. But I survived, she drains her cup. One might say, thrived. She stands and extends her a hand. I have not been honest with you. I would have let you fall into their clutches if we hadn't found a means of defeating these charlatans with their grubby stranglehold on the meagre power they have. He grins. But I am sincere now. Stand down. Let me accept their invitation. After all, I am probably worse than they are. So we can agree to her terms. Let Lady Jane go to the Green King Inn and accept whatever offer the old pretenders will make. Or we can refuse her. You have an invitation in your own name. It may be a forgery, but the old pretenders have offered you a place nonetheless. And now you have read the passphrase to the door. We do have Lady Jane's regard here that seems to allow us to pass this. And I do kind of want to go to see what it's all about. But I'm going to refuse her and go on my own. She gazes into your eyes before reaching for her pistol. Just enough to inconvenience you, she says. You'd no sooner succumb to your wounds than I. They'll take us to the tomb colonies in pieces. Or not at all. Then, slowly never breaking eye contact, she lowers the gun. But it would be a shame to cheat now, not when you've shown such resourcefulness. It was an error to show you the oath, he laughs. A worthy opponent, at last. They will not know their mistake, the old pretenders, until it is too late. I almost wish I was there to see it. He tears up her invitation and offers you a mock bow. Whatever they have done with the King Eater's crown, whatever they do to keep it, they shall not do so again. Not after you come to them. Lady Jane swears as you finish the last of the wine. Tomorrow, the Green King awaits. Apparently I'm joining the old pretenders now. Sweet! <laughs> oh, that's the other exceptional story. Let's just ignore that for a second. The Green King, at last. 
The Green King is almost as you left it, but for two things. The windows are alight with candles, and there is an earthy smell that pervades the cool London night. It is like an opened grave. As you approach, the door opens. This time, you're expected. They are waiting. Let's present ourselves. The grisly justice waits in the dolorous parlour of the king. She carries an open hand and a moss-covered knife. The grisly justice gives you a look of grim satisfaction. I thought it would be you. You are strong. The king will like that. He waits for you to say the words on the invitation. He finishes them. I am last, but I shall go first. The grisly justice gives you a gallows smile and bows with a creaky flourish. Come, the king waits below. Drink of his sorrows, and like us, you shall dwell in power forevermore. She picks a candle from an oaken bar top and approaches a cellar door. The smell of the grave is overpowering here, but you descend. The other five old pretenders wait in the cellars below. They are vast and gloomy in the green candlelight. Dead roots hang from the vaulted ceiling. The old pretenders are not alone. There are dozens and dozens of others stood in knots of six. You cannot make them out in the dim light, only that their poses are not natural. There is a whispering somewhere that might be weeping. Let's see what they have done to him. Come and pay homage to the king, the grisly justice says, her hand on your arm. Deep below the green king inn, there lies a crown. It is no metaphor, but a thing of battered bronze, rimmed in part with starlit frost. It is the size of a well, and there is only darkness within. There are eyes in the dark that might once have been a man's. They are as green as stolen emeralds. Once he was a scholar of sort, then a captain, then a thief. And now he is this. Roots grow from the crown of his head and bind him, knotted to his stolen prize. There is frost on him and bark and bone. He flourishes not kindly. The roots grow from him and bind the rest. In knots of six, they crook and bend towards him like dead weeds towards the memory of the sun. There is something like sap on their bodies and it flows from him. The old pretenders have cups of cold clay in their hands. They bend and fill them with the tears from the frozen faces of the five they have recently bound. The acerbic critic goes to drink from his, cat-like, his tongue extended. The endless inspector cuffs him, and he stops, snarling. The grisly justice turns to you. Now the oath once more, then you will join us and share in the tears of the king. His sacrifice gained us this power. We renew its bonds so that we might grow, and as he grows, so does the potency we partake from. Her voice raw with wanting. She struggles to maintain herself so close to what she desires. So we can speak the oath that will serve. Bind yourself to the king and drink of his tears. This is not a wise choice. Or we can speak the oath that will bind. Bind the old pretenders to their king. See, a small part of me is incredibly curious what would happen if I drank the tears. Anything that says that this is not a wise choice tends to be the most interesting. <laughs> but then on the other hand, I kind of want to free the poor king. I feel he's having quite the bad day. Let's... Oh, this is a really tough choice. Yeah, I don't like the old pretenders. I don't think I want to be one of them. 
So let's go with let's take the oath of all mind. You speak the words that the old king ravaged in King Eaters. The oath that would have been Percy Runcival's crowning glory had the pretenders set it back in that place. The words are like velvet and merlot on your tongue, rich and deep as a wine-dark undertow. It takes the old pretenders a beat to realise what you have said in this hallowed place. They are so intent on approaching you, hands outstretched and cups raised to taste, that which they are sure will soon flow from you unto them. They scream as the roots grow and bind and pierce. They will flourish in the dark as the roots knot them together, stilling their tongues, blinding their eyes. There are tears, indeed. And then you see him, the Green King, or what remains of the unfortunate Percy Runcival, has opened his lips. Tears golden like sap mingle with saliva and wash down his petrified face. Flowers grow between his rotten teeth, a sickly pink. The bones of his feet are continuous with the great and stolen crown, fusing together like the snake that eats its tail. Yet somehow he speaks. They drink of me, he says in a voice mildewed with years. My friends, I gave them everything. They grow me more so that there is always more to give. He gazes down at the old pretenders, presently distracted with something like hatred or something like love. I inherited hunger. It hollows me, and so I must grow. It is the price of majesty to feed and be fed. Tears come unbidden, rolling down the grooves of his pale face. It is an offering. It is all he knows how to do. Give. Though we have two options. We can slay him. You know how to slough a king from his skin. One might call it mercy. Regicide in the right hands can be. We can drink of his tears. Perhaps the old pretenders are onto something. Perhaps you would prefer he be left alive. I think I'm going to slay him. I think this is a horrible fate for any human. So let's, uh, let's free him, shall we? He does not scream. There's not enough of him left for that. But his attendants do. They who have taken of his body. Even half alive, they retain that which all mortals must. The desire to keep living. Their ragged screams are a chorus to the ragged work that you do. The crown cannot be broken, except at the feet. He is of it now as much as it is of him. But he is flesh, and if the king has two bodies, then this one is but that. It breaks, the crown is but a ring of metal, and the king is in shreds. The screaming dries up with the tears. Percy Runcival has found journey's end. The king dieth. The cellar of the green king is thick with a knotted root. The king and his silent court are guarding each other behind bound eyes. Voiceless, they gaze glassily as the ivy run over their ruined forms. It is a knot, and you at its center. Will you, can you, be permitted to leave? Attempt to leave the Green King. You have his green blood in your hands. The old pretenders scream as their king dies, racing to drink of his sap, blackening even as he falls. 
Those husks around him begin to collapse too, a court of dust spreading across the cobblestones. You are coated in them as though by a shroud, and as they wither, so too the old pretenders, bound by forsaken oaths ill-meant long ago, as their eyes desiccate. You see they know what this is, a reckoning. And then they are gone, and then they are dust. The old pretenders are no more. Whatever they gained from their king has gone into the dark with them. It is a court of silence now, and you alone of the pretenders are free. You alone shall rise again. Wow, so we got a, a memory of a tale? Night Whisper? And we lost all of our qualities. The Green King died at your hand, and the old pretenders be bound to him. And here is an epilogue in our deck. The Green King in gold. It is days later that you find amidst your usual morning detritus of bills, unwanted invitations, and dreary headlines from the Gazette, an article of interest. It seems that the Green King has burned down. Tributes flood in, effusive about a drinking establishment that no one had ever been inside. You search for information about the cellars or the remains of the Green King and those bound to him over the years. It seems, however, that nothing has been found. The inn will fade from memory, and so too those who frequented it. Alongside the article is a letter addressed to you in ink of the deepest green. Will you never be free of that place? The letter from Lady Jane. Though she does not sign it as such, she details her investigations in the cellars of the king, seeking for what he had foregone, the vines, the bonds, the dead. Your pretenders are gone, their pretense at immortality, at power, with them. He does not know what she will do now, only that she means to leave London. You will never know if they were right, if Percy Runcival had ever truly known what he did. You will carry that question like a wound. He will not see you again. He does not thank you for sparing her servitude with the pretenders, only the briefest acknowledgement that, due to you, no one ever shall again. And with that, it's the end of the exceptional story, The Green King. I hope you all enjoyed that. I am very interested. What happens if you drink from the cup and maybe don't kill? the Green King. So if you have done that, please let me know in the comments down below. Let me know what you thought of the story. It always interests me how people like these things. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and I hope you have a fantastic New Year. That's going to date this video really badly, but like I say, I'm in the middle of my... It's between Christmas and New Year's right now. I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to be recording. I'm really bad at sitting doing nothing, but here we are. But either way, thank you all very much for watching. Please like, subscribe. Let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And I'll probably see you next year.